Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, just before the break, we uh, read through Matthew chapter 21, the parable, and that is Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. Okay, so Jesus is telling her, here, what is Jesus saying? A parable. It's a parable of the wicked wine dressers. Okay. And what is Jesus trying to illustrate through this parable? The relationship between whom? God and the church. No, God and his people. Who are his people here in this context? Israel. Israel, yes, thank you, Israel. And he's talking about the coming of the kingdom of God. Okay, so it's basically, um, we, we look at it, okay, and then we'll come to the conclusion. So here the vine vineyard represents whom? The vineyard represents. It's okay, even if it's wrong, just say who is the God. your vineyard. Sorry, Kofi. The vine represent God. Oh, we didn't get what you said. Sorry. Okay, the vineyard uh, represents the world. Does it represent the world here? The vineyard? Who does it represent? Israel. It represents Israel or the people of God. Who is the landowner? God. Okay. And he has provided everything necessary for the vineyard to produce fruit. Okay. Now the hedge, the wine press, the tower signifies what look at your uh, bible the hedge the wine press the tower signifies what what do you think it signifies it signifies when there is a hedge around the wine press when there is a, 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 a there's a hedge around the vineyard there is a wine press there's a tower what is the owner of the vineyard trying to do Safeguard it, protect it. Basically, it's God taking care of the vineyard. It's basically God's care and provision. He's ensuring that the vineyard is well equipped to thrive. Okay. Now, when a person plants a vineyard, they will put a hedge, right? And there's all of them can come and pluck all their grapes, and uh, you know, the animals can also come and eat it up. Okay, so it's talking about God's care, protection. Why tower? Because there's somebody who sits up and like a watchman and watches the entire place. Okay, so um, God is in, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's uh, ensuring that the vineyard is cared for, protected, and also it's a well equipped vineyard to thrive. Okay, the vine dressers, who are the vine dressers? If the vineyard is Israel, who are the wine dressers? The leaders, okay, the leaders or the caretakers of Israel. They were given the responsibility to lead and help the people of Israel to bear fruit for God. Okay. Now, um, the mistreatment of the servants are whom? The servants who are mistreated are whom? How can it be we, when we're talking about Israel and God, how can it be we? Who are the servants who are mistreated? Israel? Israel people are beating up uh, the Israel people. Apostles, teachers, preachers. Yeah, servants. but we didn't have apostles, preachers, uh, uh, teachers. We had teachers Prophet. in the Old Testament. Prophet. Yes, it's a prophet. Yes, thank you, Lucy. It's a prophet, right? God chose the prophets, and it's through the prophets that God spoke his word. Hey, everyone, think in the context that we are looking at. Okay, So the owner of the vineyard sends his servants 
and these are the prophets whom God sent uh, to call the people to repentance, to call the people of Israel to repentance. But what did they do to the prophets? They rejected the prophets, they beat them up, okay? So it is reflecting or it is showing us what? That Israel has rejected the the message, rejected the king. They have re rejected the king's message or God's message. Who does the son represent? Okay, Jesus, the son of God. Okay, and it was the wine dresser's decision to kill the son. Right? Yes or no? So it symbolizes whom? The wine dresser's decision to kill the son symbolizes whom? The Jewish leaders who rejected and eventually crucified Jesus, okay? And because they wanted to maintain their own control and authority, okay? Now, Jesus asked what the owner of the vineyard will do, right? Because they killed his son also. What will the owner of the vineyard do? And here the religious leaders themselves are responding to the answer. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will destroy the wicked men miserably. Yes, he will destroy them. And what will he do? He will give the vineyard to? The other wine dressers. To others. He'll give it to others. Okay. So what is it basically talking here? When he will destroy them and give the vineyard to somebody else, what is it talking here? From Jewish people to the Gentile group. Okay. So when he's saying he's going to destroy them, what is he talking about? What aspect of God? God's? I think we should keep doing more of this. So that God's your brains judgment. Are... God's judgment. Yes, thank you. Praise God for Lucy and for Gertrude. <laughs> it's talking about God's judgment on Israel. Okay. For rejecting God, rejecting the prophets, even rejecting their son and he's going to transfer the kingdom to whom ah, very happy to us <laughs> yeah he's going to give the kingdom to the new people who will bear food for his kingdom and who is that the church the believers, us, the, the, believers the saints it's us okay now verses 20 42 to 44 who is the stone Oh, this is rejected, yes. And so Jesus is referring here to Psalm 118, verse 22, where he's identifying himself as a rejected stone that becomes the cornerstone. Uh, and this signifies that he, despite his rejection, Jesus will be the, even though people rejected him, even if people have crucified him, Jesus is going to be the chief cornerstone for what? For the, say loudly, church. Yes, he's going to be the chief cornerstone for the church. He's a foundational element for the new kingdom that is going to be initiated through the church. Okay. Now, the imagery of that falling of the stone that will be broken or the stone falling and grinding someone to powder is what? What we read, verse 43 and 44. Yes, he's talking about... Judgment, yes. It's uh, talking about the consequences of rejecting Jesus and the coming of the kingdom. Okay. So 44 says that, and whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whom, whomever it falls, it will grind them to powder. So whoever falls on the stone and the consequences of the of sin. The fall, that is sin, okay? It says, whoever falls on the stone, that means who of them willingly, in spite, even, known, even after knowing the truth, even after knowing that Jesus is the Messiah, willfully, you know, going against him, it's like they fall on the stone, and what happens when you fall on a stone? You'll die, right? There is eternal consequences. There is death. And also it says that, but on whoever ever it falls, it will grind them to powder. It's, it's talking about the consequences of rejecting Jesus and the coming of God. Hmm. 
Okay. Yes, so you have known the truth, you have rejected the truth, and on a day of judgment, there is eternal consequences. There is, you you'll die, but there is also eternal death. It's basically an imagery, right? So when you fall on a stone, you don't become powder, right? Because you are falling on the stone, you hit your head and die. When, a st when something falls on you, you know, you, you are crushed. It's just saying that you are totally crushed. Your bones, everything can be crushed. Or when the, you're, you're uh, you know, grinding the stone against something, it becomes powder. It's just an image in the imagery, but it's basically talking it, uh, the consequences of rejecting Jesus. And it's talking about the coming of the kingdom. Okay. Now, verses 45 to 46. Okay. Now, the chief priests and Pharisees, they understand that Jesus is condemning whom? Yeah, he's condemning them. Okay. And so they uh, want to kill him and they want to get done with him. Okay. So basically here it's talking about, this parable is talking about a shift in the responsibility of bearing fruits for the kingdom. From whom? From the? Where's the shift from? Chief priests. Okay. Jewish leaders. Okay. Who else? The nation of Israel. Okay. To whom? The shift is from the nation of Israel to whom? Gentiles or to the church. Okay. So the church is representing a new nation or a people who are called to live out and spread the values and the teachings of the kingdom of God and hence bear fruit. Okay. So the church is seen as a steward of the kingdom. So we have the privilege, we have the, but we have also the responsibility. Okay. Israel, God's chosen people, they did not receive it. The kingdom was passed on to the church. So imagine when uh, God judged Israel, how much more he will judge us as his people if we are not bearing fruit for his kingdom. Okay. So the church is seen as a new steward of the kingdom and we are given the responsibility to bear fruit and to live according to the teaching and uh, the values of the kingdom of God. Okay. So the new nation, which is the church, is, you know, basically talking about the, uh, the church, God's people. It extends beyond just a chosen few. That's the Jews. It extends boundaries, extends beyond ethnicity, beyond national boundaries, and includes all who believe in Jesus, who accept him, who follow him, will be part of the church. So the church is not a place where we sit down, we are comfortable, we are fed, we become like fat, fattened calves, and we are waiting for the uh, second coming, or we're waiting, you know, for the uh, uh, rapture to happen. But as a church, God is looking for fruit. Tell your neighbor, God is looking for fruit. Yeah, tell yourself, God is looking for fruit in my life. And you know what the parables we see, right? If we, we don't bear fruit, what is going to happen? Yes, he's king. He's, um, and he is um, gracious, merciful, but is also looking for fruit. And he's also looking for us to be good stewards of what he's entrusted to us. Okay? So that is about the kingdom of God. Okay? Any questions about the church and the kingdom? Any questions about the church and the kingdom? Before we move on to chapter 4. No questions? I hope you are uh, stirred up to know that you have the authority. You have to exercise the authority. You have to use the authority. And God has... Uh, taken the authority from the nation of Israel, who is his beloved, his chosen ones, whom he loves very much, and he's given it to the church. So he's looking for fruit, right? So we need to bear fruit. Yes, please use the mic, Nelson. Yes. Will there be any get in kingdom? Sorry? Will there be any get in kingdom? 
gate in the kingdom which kingdom kingdom of heaven yeah yeah it talks about heaven having pearly gates and all of those things maybe there is so who is the i mean the gatekeeper it says like so who is the gatekeeper actually who is the gatekeeper <laughs> <laughs> who is the gatekeeper in heaven uh, we'll ask jesus to reveal to us in dreams and visions tonight <laughs> or some prophetic word i don't know who is the gatekeeper uh, but we just know that there is pearly gates in heaven yeah it's beautiful pearls not just like uh, sun but it's just beautiful Now you like to be the gatekeeper, Nelson. You can tell God when you come there. I like to be the gatekeeper. It's a good op responsibility, and I'm sure he'll uh, he'll give it to you. He's a good God. <laughs> Vimal is next in line. Vimal, you also want to be? Uh, he wants to be worship leader. Huh? <laughs> Uh, okay. Any questions, sister? Yes. Hello, sister. Can we connect Matthew twenty one forty two to mm -hmm. Matthew sixteen eighteen? The on this rock that is the revelation on which uh, Jesus is going to build the church. Yes, we can because he is that rock, right? Okay. On which he is yeah. going to build the church. Yes. Yes. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Lucy. Okay, we'll move on to uh, yes, success. Uh, I don't think there's going to be any gatekeeper in heaven because the angels are going to be at the guide. You know, at the judgment gate, uh, the angels are when they are open the book. Is go to when the book is going to open. If the fellow is not qualified, is going to hell. Is qualified, is going to heaven. So I don't think there's going to be a gatekeeper in heaven. <laughs> okay thank you success there is uh, no gatekeeper sorry nelson i think i don't i don't know but uh, but you can still tell god nelson and i think he's a loving god he will make you the gatekeeper he can bring about that position okay <laughs> there's nothing that he can't do for you he loves you Nelson, one of our in-person student, Nelson wants to be the gatekeeper, the pearly gates. So I'm telling him that, just giving him some encouragement. <laughs> okay, okay, we'll move on to chapter four. Okay. Um, so the teachings of the kingdom of God. Okay, even as you're learning about the kingdom of God, I hope it's impacting your thinking yes your perspectives yeah your value systems your priorities our entire uh, mindsets will be changed when you know these truths believe these truths these truths will set you free okay so you're going to look at this chapter we're going to focus upon kingdom thinking okay so let's look at what paul writes in colossians chapter 1 verses 12 to 13 can somebody read that, please? Giving thanks to the Father who is qualified us to partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Amen. So what does it verse say? That God has already, what has He done for us? delivered us from the power of darkness before delivered us the first verse 12 the first phrase he has qualified, he has qualified us. us yes he has qualified each one of you what has he already yeah. qualified us for inheritance yes he has qualified us to partake or to enjoy the inheritance that he has for his people for his saints okay verse 3 says he has delivered us from the powers of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his own dear son. So you are in the kingdom of whom? God. You are in the kingdom of Jesus. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of what? Kingdom of light. light. Yes. And you have been brought out of which kingdom? 
darkness and you brought into the kingdom of light okay and we know that darkness and light are totally opposite to each other right so is the kingdom of god or so is the kingdom of jesus and is the kingdom of satan that radically totally opposite just like darkness and light okay so we are used to living in the kingdom of darkness which is a totally opposite from the kingdom of light but now we are into a totally new different kingdom you are now in the kingdom of jesus christ and so it is very important that you change your thinking your perspective your mindset you know it's very difficult for us to change our perspectives and our mindsets okay but we need to make a conscious effort why because we have come from a totally contrasting different kingdom a kingdom of darkness the kingdom of satan you know and we've come to a totally different new kingdom kingdom of light and kingdom of jesus so it is a change we have to make a change in our thinking okay so that is where the key lies the key lies all in obedience yes but obedience comes in our thinking in our mental framework in our in our understanding okay um jesus said well look at what jesus said uh, in john chapter 18 verse 36 what does he say read it john chapter 18 verse 36 jesus answered my kingdom is not of this world if my kingdom were of this world my servants would fight so that i should not be delivered to the jews but now my kingdom is not from here amen so he says my kingdom is not from here my kingdom is not of this world so we belong to a kingdom that is not of this world but you are living in this kingdom of the world but you don't belong to the kingdom of this world you belong to the kingdom of heaven therefore we are in a kingdom where you know the perspectives the lifestyles the value the purposes everything is different from this kingdom of this world okay and where is the kingdom of god is inside us okay look at what apostle john wrote in 1 john chapter 4 verses 5 and 6 can somebody read that please 1 john chapter 4 verse 5 and 6 they are of the world therefore they speak a as of the world and the world hears them we are of god he who knows god hears us he who is not of god does not hear us but by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error knowing god through love amen so the people of the world speak as they speak as the people of the world okay so we who are of god we need to speak as we need to speak how we speak as of god that means what does it mean there's even a difference in the way we speak because we are not from this world we're not of this world we are of the kingdom of god and even in our speaking we speak as of god So to speak as of God we need to therefore change the way we think because the way we think is the way we speak and we have to adapt to a new way of thinking thinking according to the kingdom of God and when we do that our we also will adapt to the new way of speaking so instead of saying hey i can't do this right i'll always fail this is impossible i can never overcome this weakness how do you speak that is as you are speaking of the children of the world but as children of the kingdom of god how do you speak i can do all things through christ who strengthens me okay with god all things are possible and he will enable me to do what i cannot god's strength is manifested in my weakness amen so we need to adapt to a new way of thinking a new paradigm a new frame of mind and this is what we call as kingdom thinking okay so jesus in his teaching he shared about this new paradigm way of kingdom thinking so we look at some of the 
parables. So the more we think as people of the kingdom of light, the more we will behave like people of the kingdom of light. And hence we will manifest or we will demonstrate more of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of light here on earth. Amen. I'll say that again. Okay. Uh, Jesus, you know, he talked about this new paradigm, a shift of way of thinking. So the more we think as people of the kingdom of light, the more we will behave like people of the kingdom and hence we will demonstrate and manifest more of that kingdom of God or the kingdom of light here on earth. Okay. Uh, in John chapter 18, when Jesus was, you know, interviewed by Pilate, Jesus was brought before Pilate and uh, Pilate asked him some questions and Pilate tells Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And what does Jesus answer? Are you, yeah, it is as you say, or are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you concerning me? Okay. And then we see in that conversation in John chapter 18, uh, verse 36, Jesus said, you know, my kingdom is not of this world. Okay. So meaning Jesus is saying that my kingdom is from where? My kingdom is from where? from above, from heaven. It's totally a different kingdom. It does not belong to the kingdom of this world. And my Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, which means that you and I are now, when we are born again, we are born again to the kingdom of God, and we are now no longer the kingdom of this world. We do not belong to the kingdom of this world. Okay? And um, uh, we are in a kingdom that's not of this world. Now, you can say, hey, it's difficult, right, to change your mindset. We are living in this world. We have to think like people of this world because we are from this world, okay? You say it's difficult to change our thinking. Jesus may have told some parables, but changing our thinking is not so easy. It is difficult. I'll give you an example, okay? Now, for example, you're living in Bangalore City. Okay, and let's say you're driving in Bangalore City. Now, in Bangalore City, there is no lane discipline. Nobody follows lane discipline. Everyone is in and out. Suddenly, you're going and suddenly somebody will come in front of you or somebody will come behind you or the side. There's no, absolutely no lane discipline. Okay, and, um, you know, you can drive however you want. You know, it's the uh, signal is coming to orange, it's going to turn red but you say okay let me just it's almost turned red let me just whiz past okay so don't follow traffic signals don't wait for others nothing okay so we know that all of us go right left you know any direction we want thank god there's nobody going over cars and under the cars okay other than that we do everything else we're doing life left right everything is allowed here everything is permissible here okay and traffic lights, we obey occasionally, okay? There's no policeman. We think, okay, red light, it's okay, we'll just go, right? And when there's parking um, signs, there's no policeman there. We'll just park anywhere and everywhere, you know, because we think it's okay. Every Somebody's parked here, I'll also park it here, okay? And we know that, uh, you know, we can drink tea, coffee, just throw the sun, tissue paper. We can wipe our hands, just throw it out the window, you know, wipe our nose, throw the tissue paper out of the window. We're eating a chocolate. We finish eating a biscuit, you know, biscuit packet. We throw it, goes right out of the window. All that is allowed in Bangalore City, right? Now, just imagine you take the plane. All of you imagining? You're taking the plane and you're going to New York, okay? <laughs> Some of them are so excited. <laughs> okay, you, you go to New York. And just say you've been living in New York, Daniel is saying, wow. Okay, you go to New York and uh, you've been living there in New York, okay, for some time. So you have driving license and everything. You rent a car and you go. Immediately, what will you do? You follow lane discipline, right? When you see it's red, what will you do? Stop. When you're taking a turn or in a junction, you see the 
stop sign and you will stop. Even if there's no traffic lights in some places, there is a stop, you have to stop. In junctions, it's so beautiful in that country. In junctions, when you go there, you know, uh, the first person will go, then the other person will know from this side, then you go, the other person from that side will come. Nobody tells them there is no traffic signal. Everyone just follows the rule. You go, the other person has to go, I have to wait, then next is my turn, then the other person comes. Just so beautifully they follow it. Even Indians follow that when they go to the US. Okay, but here, everybody wants to be first at the junction and that is why we are all clogged up in unity and oneness there okay so you and then you're eating you get coffee okay you drink your coffee and you don't put down your window and throw it on the road what do you do you go to the hotel or wherever you are staying you throw it in the trash can okay so you stay there for say a week a month and you come back to india okay Come back to India, you take your car, okay, and again, you follow the lane discipline. No, you're all in and out, curves, this, that, honking, you know, there and all in the US, you don't honk. You're fully honking, give way, give way, and you're drinking your coffee, out goes the cup from the flyover, it's gone somewhere, you know, you wipe your nose, tissue paper is out. So what am I trying to say? Come back to India. Bangalore, no lane discipline, you know, speed limit is not there. You see 30, 60, don't follow the speed limit. In just one week or one month, you follow the rule and the discipline over there. But when you come back to your own country, you don't. So what are we trying to say? Two points that I want to bring out here. First of all, you know, we say cultures are very, very different. The way you think in one culture is very different from the other culture. Our culture affects our behavior. But what am I trying to prove is, can we adjust to culture? Yes, you are just to Bangalore culture, you are just to that culture. You're able to follow rules, you're able to change your thinking pattern, you're able to follow things. I'm saying this because I myself have gone to that country and I've come back and I find myself doing some of the same things because I drive on Bangalore's roads and sometimes I've thrown things. I do the same things. Okay, Andrew saying. Okay, so sometimes you do the same things, right? But what am I trying to say? That we can't say that we can't change our thinking. That our perspectives can't change. Because we can see, we can change. When our behavior changes there for one month, why can't we follow the same behavior here, right? So I keep telling myself, you don't follow what others are doing. You follow the lane discipline. You don't throw things. You keep it in your car. You keep it with you and go and drop it in the trash can at home. See? So this is also a city. Make it have, have you know, uh, let it be clean. Also follow the lane discipline, okay? So the thing is two things. Okay, First of all, cultures. The way you think you know, in your culture is so different and it affects your behavior, right? And the second thing is you have the potential to change. We all have the potential to change. Nobody can say, hey, I cannot change. So what am I trying to say is you can change your way of thinking, okay? Just imagine you're getting to the plane, going overseas, you're just totally a different person. But when you're in India, you're behaving totally different okay so you have the ability to change now when we are in the kingdom of god the kingdom of god has a culture and that culture is very different from the culture of this world the the mindsets the way of thinking the patterns of thinking the framework of thinking you know the thoughts the perceptions in the kingdom of god is very different from the kingdom of this world so although you are in the kingdom of the world you and i are called to live according to the culture of the kingdom of god and can we do it yes we can do it because we see you know just a couple of hours difference we can change our perspectives we can change our thinking we can adapt to the cultures wherever we go okay so in reality the kingdom of god is in us but, you know, unfortunately, what has happened for many of us is that we have not transitioned in our kingdom thinking, okay? We are born again, 
we some of us don't even know whether we are part of the kingdom of god or not but we just know we are born again but you know we also need to adapt to the new culture the new lifestyles the new way of thinking that we are part of now okay so that is what we need to do so hopefully you know with this uh, at the end of this course you will all be challenged enough to say that you know hey i know i'm part of the kingdom of god and i need to start thinking i need to start living kingdom perspective kingdom lifestyles and you know you say i i think i need to start looking at the things the way jesus wants me to look at things okay and it's possible we can do it yes or no yes okay but able to think from a we can be uh, we are able to think from a kingdom perspective our lives will be changed and the way we live will also be change but for us to know what is the kingdom thinking we need to look at what jesus talks about it in his gospels or what he has spoken about in his parables but if you are able to think from a kingdom perspective our lives will be changed the way we live will be changed our lifestyles and our behaviors will be changed and we will truly demonstrate the kingdom of god in our world okay but it all has to begin with our thinking yes now jesus taught a lot about kingdom thinking someone had their hand up i don't know who that is okay so jesus taught a lot about kingdom thinking and this is um, how you know you and i need to think as people in god's kingdom so i want you to to i want to encourage each one of you to really develop a kingdom mindset a kingdom framework in which you think in which you look at things in which you perceive things in which you understand things in which you also make your decisions and your choices and imagine if we all do that you know we will truly be a kingdom community right where we are exhibiting or fully representing the king of this kingdom and also when we think according to kingdom perspective and mindset we will have a kingdom culture amongst us amen okay so what are some of the things that jesus taught us about the kingdom okay so look at um, some of the things that jesus taught us about his kingdom the things that he taught us about his kingdom is a higher standard of living than the kingdom of the world and we'll see how okay look at what um uh, jesus says in um, matthew chapter 5 verses 21 to 30 can somebody read that please matthew chapter 5 verse that was 21 to 30 you have heard that it was said to say of old you shall not murder and however murder will be in danger of the judgment but i say to you that however whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and whoever says to his brother shall uh, raka rap shall brother raka shall be in danger of the council but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire therefore if you bring you your gift to the altar and there and there remember that you that your brother has something against you leave your gift there before the al before the altar and go your way first be reconciled to your brother and there come and offer you offer your gift agree with your adversary quickly while you are on, on the way with him let least your adversary deliver you to the ju- judge. judge the judge had you over the officer and you be thrown into prison as certainly i say to you you will be no means get out of there will out of the till you have paid the least penny last penny last penny you have had that it was said to those who hold you shall not commit adultery but i say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust or lust for her has already 
committed adultery with her in his heart if your right eye causes your to you to sin pluck it out and cast it from you for it is more profitable for you that one of your member perish that for you whole body to be cast into hell and if your right hand curse curses you you to sin cut it off and cast it from you for it for it is more profitable from for you that one of your member perish that for you whole body to be cast into hell amen so this is pretty radical yes or no what is jesus saying here you know that when you murder what will happen you are in danger of judgment but what is jesus saying here yes even when you are you know um uh hating somebody that is equal to murder so jesus is saying that you know in this world when you commit murder you are in serious danger of judgment okay you're going to face something serious but jesus is saying i'm telling you that in the, from the kingdom that i'm coming from it's not just murder that you are going to be in the serious judgment but even if you have hatred in your heart is equal to murder and that is serious jesus says you know if you commit adultery you know it is there is judgment okay but jesus is saying the kingdom that i am coming from not just adultery but even if you look at a woman lustfully in your heart to possess her even if you've not committed the act even if you just thought about it looked it looked at her in a lustful manner that is sin okay so here jesus is saying hey this is here's the deal you know if your right eye causes you to sin what should you do pluck it out if your right hand causes you to sin what should you do cut it off so what is he meaning to say here what is he meaning to say if your right hand causes whatever is causing you to sin depart from it okay take it off he's saying whatever is causing you to sin deal with it in a very severe manner no don't take sin very lightly just deal with it in a very severe manner so he's saying each one of us how do we deal with the sins in our life we deal with it in a very severe manner we take action because in the kingdom of god there is zero tolerance to sin there is no tolerance to sin there is zero tolerance to sin okay so when you are rooming off your eye or you're cutting off your hand there is going to be some pain or there's going to be a lot of pain in the process okay so that is what he's saying is kingdom thinking okay you know usually we tend to come to live according to the standards that are around us yes or no like i said here in bangalore the way we you know drive in the traffic follow traffic rules uh, traffic signals you know the way we throw things around well that is the standard that we all have set in 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 uh, countries abroad that is not the standard but jesus is saying don't go down to the level or the norm of the kingdom that you once belonged to so when we're yielding to the kingdom thinking lifestyle patterns framework of the kingdom of the world we're actually lowering ourselves down okay so jesus says don't go down to that level that norm of the kingdom of that you belong to once but this is the way that you have to live in the kingdom right often we justify ourselves you know um we say like hey nobody here following the traffic rules why should i follow right or am i in a hurry to go anyway there's so much of dirt on the road what is there if i throw another tissue paper or just a, a tea cup right everyone is doing it why not i everyone is doing things in the workplace to get perks to get promotions to climb up the ladder of success why not i okay so we are constantly looking at people in our community in our locality in our apartment complex in our workplace you know when we were in school in college we look at our colleagues uh, who are not from the kingdom and they don't have the kingdom culture they don't have the kingdom 
mindsets. And when we see them doing things that they shouldn't be doing, and we say, hey, we can also do it, then we know there is something basically very, very wrong. If you're saying, hey, I can also do it. We need to say, tell ourselves that, hey, I don't belong to this kingdom, right? And that's a sh great mistake when we say, I can also do it when they are doing it. They are people from the world. They will do it. They can do it. Maybe they can do it. Why? Because they belong to the kingdom of this world. But we are not of the kingdom of this. We are not of the kingdom of this world, right? Yes. So we need, we belong to the kingdom of the of God, and that is how we need to live. Okay. Um, so we don't say things are okay when we do that. It's okay, little weaknesses. It's okay to say a little lie in the office and get away with things. Okay. No, we belong to a kingdom where the culture is very different. Okay. Um, and if it's something is causing you to sin, then you cut it off because that is our culture. We don't engage in it. We don't enjoy it. We don't tolerate it. We don't make it as a pet in our lives. Okay. So, there's a much higher standard to the kingdom that we belong to. And we need to live by that kingdom because we belong to that kingdom. So the way you live identifies or shows which kingdom you belong to. Okay. Now Jesus talked about the kingdom and he talked about the power of love in Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 to 44. Can somebody read that please? Matthew chapter 5, 43 to 44. Can I read, sister? Sure, please. <clears throat> Matthew 5, 43 to 44. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Amen. So he said, what does Jesus say? The way of the world is, those who love you, you love them. If your enemy hates you, you hate them. If your neighbor hates you, you hate them. But Jesus is saying, hey, listen, in the kingdom of the world, you love those who are lovable and you hate those who are not lovable. But in the kingdom that I'm coming from, which you are part of, okay, you love everybody. You love people who love you, people who are lovable. You love people who hate you, who are your enemies, who mistreat you, who do things wrong against you. You still love them. You still bless them. You sp still speak good over their lives. Now imagine if our churches would be so different if we actually had this kingdom perspective, this kingdom thinking of loving one and other. Our churches would be so different you know, if we actually were a kingdom community who simply live by God, um, uh, the kingdom teachings that Jesus taught us. Okay. So just do good to those who hate you and who despitefully use you. Okay. So when you are in difficult situations, whether in the church, you know, it's your brother or sister sitting next to you, you know, who is accidentally or knowingly or ignorantly or whatever done wrong towards you or it's a situation in your workplace or in a home, you know, or in a gathering where you feel that you are wronged, but because you belong to the kingdom of God, because you belong to a different culture, in your culture, you know, it's not normal to retaliate evil for evil. In your culture, it's not normal, you know, it's in your culture, it's very normal to love those who hate you, who mistreat you and who are, uh, you know, doing, not doing, that is, things that are right towards you. So what should you do in return? You should love them, okay? So the kingdom of God is a culture where love is the norm. And that is why Jesus said, uh, uh, Paul writes, he said, love is, Ephesians 13, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it's not rude, it's not... Um, uh, uh, evil, it does not seek the wrong, it always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That is the kind of love that we will, that is part of the kingdom of God, and that is the, the norm that we need to follow. That is a 
culture that we need to follow. Okay. So Jesus said, this is the way the kingdom of God is. We need to love others, even if they do things that are wrong or even if they hate us. Okay. We stop here. Any questions? No questions? Okay. Thank you everyone for joining class and I'll meet you next week. Thank you.